to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 5 through 11. You folks watching by television, get your King James Version of the Bible, open, up your, uh, open it up to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, and I want to preach a message entitled, Do You Bow the Knee? Do you bow the knee? I should have named it, Every Knee Shall Bow, but do you bow the knee? Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Paul's speaking to the church at Philippi, and he says this. He says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of things in heaven, in things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ, not man, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Beloved, we need this message today because so many people are looking to science and they think that all of our politicians or uh, some expert here or there is going to be our savior. And that's not true. That's certainly not true. And uh, I want you to know that all of them are going to bow the knee to Jesus someday. Do you bow the knee? Let's go to the throne of grace. Father in heaven, I pray. Oh, God in heaven, I pray that you'd pour out your spirit and grace and glory upon us. Father, we set aside the cares of the world. We forget about all these things we got to do in our life. And we focus on the message and hear what the Spirit has to say to our hearts. Lord God, I pray that your hand would be upon this preacher. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The early church uh, and the Reformers call verses 5 through 11 the Carmen Christi. That's C-A-R-M-E-N, the Carmen Christi. You say, preacher, what's that? That's Latin for the hymn of Christ. In fact, many times in the early churches, you read the father, with so-called fathers, I call them, you will find that they sung this at a baptism. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, will be in the form of God, thought of not wrong. And I'm not going to quote the whole thing to you. But it came to be known as the common Christi, the hymn of Christ. And ladies and gentlemen, it was a creedal song of worship and adoration and exaltation sung to the Lord Jesus Christ as being God. In the early church, there were great battles over Christology. Who was Jesus Christ? Was he God or was he man? Was he just some divine being like an angel? And so what they used to do, because they didn't have Bibles like we do, was they would put pen to parchment and they would create songs that would be sung and people would memorize them and they'd understand some gospel truth about who Jesus really was. So folks, these verses speak of Christ's humiliation. It speaks of his humanity when he condescended at the incarnation and took on human flesh to become a man without ever ceasing to be God. Would you say amen? I've told you before, he was a theanthropos. He was, uh, theo mean God, anthropos uh, in Greek is, is man. We get anthropology from it, the, the, the God-man. In other words, he was deity enshrined, enshrouded, and enfleshed in humanity. He was both, now listen to me, and it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this. He was fully God and fully man in one divine person without ever confusing the two natures. The two natures were known as the hypostatic union. Now, beloved, this hypostatic union of his divine and human nature <clears throat> in theology is known as the doctrine of the kenosis. The word kenosis in scripture in Greek means to empty oneself. So this is the doctrine of the self-emptying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or, let me back it up, self-emptying of God in Christ. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, I don't plan to, uh, or intend to give you a deep theological exegesis of these texts today. But what I do want you to have is a brief understanding of them so you can understand the context of where I'm going with the sermon. Would you say amen? 
But these verses speak of the mystery of the incarnation and what Christ had to do to become a man. How that Christ always pre-existed as the eternal son of the living God, the second person of the divine triune Godhead. And yet, he was still God in the flesh. And how he is co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent, co-inherent, co-essential, consubstantial with both God the Father and God the Holy Spirit and of how this mysterious three-in-one deity comprises the one true triune God, the most blessed Holy Trinity in unity, the thrice holy God. Would you say amen out there? Now, if I elaborated on this, we'd be here for four hours. But ladies and gentlemen, what I just said to you, now listen to me, is the confession of the historic Orthodox Christian Church and faith down through the centuries, and it's also what we believe here at Temple Christ Messiah. We are Orthodox when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we make no apologies for our beloved. We worship one God in three separate and distinct, yet indivisible persons in one divine being. Would you say amen out there? Now this is a deep doctrine, and I don't plan to work it out today. Yet when the Lord Jesus Christ left heaven, when he tiptoed across the Milky Way and came to earth to become a man at his miraculous incarnation, beloved, so he could die on the cross to redeem us, he temporarily, the Bible says, set aside, he rid himself. He emptied and divested himself of his glorious divine aura and attributes like his omnis. In other words, when Christ walked to earth, he was not omnipresent. He was not omniscient. He was infallible. Whatever God spoke to him, he knew. And God gave him the, he had the fullness of the Spirit, the Spirit without measure. And when Christ was on this earth, he was not uh, the almighty or omnipotent God like he was before he took on human flesh. So that's what we mean by the omnis. But beloved, he set these aside without ever ceasing to be God and God in the flesh. Would you say Amen. In other words, beloved, in his humanity, he but briefly renounced the exercise of his divine rights and attributes and equality with God that also belonged to him as being God. Come on and say amen out there. But upon his resurrection, upon his glorification, beloved, he took back these things. And the Bible says he ascended back to heaven to resume his glory, to resume his office as the eternal God seated and enthroned at the Father's right hand. Now I know this is kind of theological to you, but you need to grow and you need to know these things. Amen? You see, beloved, the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of the incarnation of Christ is indeed a mystery, and it's far above and beyond our ability to fully comprehend, to fully fathom to fully understand it as mere fallen, finite, feeble-minded mortal men. Amen? I don't quite understand it. I, I, I always say it's, it's like the, the, the three-in-one God is like the sun, the light of the sun, and the heat of the sun. Or it's like water, it's like condensation, it's like ice. And that's how I try to teach it, beloved. But I can tell you right now, this preacher, with all the study I've tried to do, I do not fully understand that. I don't understand how the Holy Spirit, being a person, can live in you and me and someone else over in China. Do you? Yet, that is true. And so through faith, beloved. See, that's why we walk by faith and not by sight. So we can grasp these things. Because through faith we understand that the world was framed by the Word of God. <laughs> How we spoke everything ex nihilio, everything out of nothing. We have to believe it, that God has a supernatural power and ability to be able to do that. Would you say amen out there? And beloved, nevertheless, this doctrine of, of Christ's incarnation and the Trinity is indeed true. Amen? And that's why Paul said this in 1 Timothy 3.16. He says, listen, he says, and without controversy, I'm not even going to argue about this. God was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen of angels. He was believed on in the world, preached unto the Gentiles, received up into glory. Would you say amen out there? Now you say to me, preacher, why have you told me all this? I'm glad you asked that question. You're a very astute audience this morning. Because, beloved, many, and I mean many today in both the church and the world, have ignored what the scriptures say about Christ and have tried to bring him down 
to their level as being just a mere man because they want a kinder and gentler Lord and Savior they can identify with. You see, beloved, a lot of folks want one uh, that judges no one, that approves of everyone and condemns none. But that's not the Savior or Lord of the Bible, is it? That's not the Jesus that I know. You see, beloved, we quote John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But verse 17 says, For his Son came not to condemn the world, but the world through him may be saved. He that believeth on him, he, the Bible says, is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So we're already condemned. Jesus didn't come down to condemn us. He came to save us. And if we don't get saved, we're going to be condemned. So we need to understand uh, something about Christ's deity uh, as well as his divinity. Amen? So a lot of people see Jesus. They want to see Jesus just as their Savior or just as their Deliverer or just as their Helper. Uh, a lot of people say, Jesus is my provider. Well, that's good. These things are all true. Jesus is my friend. Yes, he's a friend that sticketh closer than the brother. But few ever want to see Jesus in all of his glory and all of his exaltation. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, they don't want to see him as their king. They don't want to see him as their master. They do not want to see him as their God and their Lord that they must bow down before in willful submission in their daily lives. We get saved, we make Christ Lord of our life, not just Savior. You can't have Jesus just as your Savior. He must be Savior and Lord of your life. Would you say amen? But you need a Savior before you need a Lord. But once you get a Savior, you get the Lord. You see, beloved, I'm saying we need to bow down in willful submission, uh, both here and hereafter, in this life and in the next life, to Jesus Christ, who is the one true creator, redeemer, Lord God, and he should be the Lord God of your life if you proclaim to be a Christian here today. Not just, hey, I got saved five years ago or 20 years ago, but I'm doing my own thing now. You see, beloved, that Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. I want you to look at verses 10 and 11 again. Paul says that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things in the subterranean regions under the earth. And he says that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, not was Lord, not shall be Lord, but Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, as you study this text, beloved, you can see that twice Paul uses the word every. It's the Greek word pas. He uses pas here, beloved, and it's, he uses it with an all-inclusive and universal implication and dimension. Every name, universally. Notice the, the all uh, the inclusivity there. And it means that all angelic beings and men everywhere who have ever lived that now dwell in heaven or they dwell down here on earth or they dwell in hell under the earth will both individually and corporately someday do two things to the Lord Jesus Christ, either willingly or unwillingly, beloved. They'll either do it now in this life volitionally or Jesus is saying, or Paul is saying, they will be forced and compelled to do it later in the next life on the day of judgment when they stand before God as their judge. And all of us are going to. You see, beloved, they will bow. That's the first thing I want you to see. They will bow. Notice that word bow. Camp two. It means to bend the knee in submission and subjection to Jesus as being the most divine and supreme being, Lord and King of the universe, and especially now over your life as a Christian. For example, beloved, all of us have seen the subjects in both ancient and modern mar monarchies bow the knee when they meet or they greet their king. Uh, we've seen it on television. They take a knee. Now, why do they do that? They do it out of respect for him, beloved. They know that his position as a dignitary, he's royalty, he's the one who rules over them. So they may bow a little bit or go like this or get down on their knee. You see, that's why they do it. And so in the scripture here, beloved, likewise, 
Paul is saying that someday all men, all angels, all moral beings in every realm shall do this to the Lord Jesus Christ on the day of judgment and see him as the sovereign king and lord and ruler of heaven and earth. The question is this, have you bowed the knee to Jesus yet? Do you bow the knee to Jesus every day of your life? Do you? See, Paul's talking to Christians here, isn't he? And beloved, I could give you a hundred scriptures on bowing, I, but I'm, I, there's so much uh, other things I want to say here. You ought to look it up sometime. The Lord gave me this on my vacation. <clears throat> Excuse me. But beloved, do you bow the knee to him willingly as your Lord and Savior? Do you bow the knee to him willingly as your king and ruler? Do you bow the knee to him regularly in your life, beloved, as your sovereign master, as the divine authority, and the controller of your life? Not you, not you ruling over your own life. Do you bow the knee to him? I hope that you do. I hope you can say, Amen, I do. So many of us, when we first get saved, we lose that concept. We get busy with our own life. And we get all these other things to start taking precedent and priority over our life. And that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to get so busy, beloved, that you can't, you take Jesus and you relegate him to a second priority. You put him uh, somewhere out there and you say, well, I still believe in you, Jesus. How would you like your husband or your wife to treat you like that? I love you, honey, but you know what? I've got, I'm too busy with work right now. I can't come home. I can't kiss you. I can't be here for you, but I love you. How would you like that? You wouldn't like that. That's exactly right, brother. But you see, beloved, either you're going to bow to Jesus now, the Bible says, or you'll be forced to compel to do it later to him on the day of judgment as your judge. But he says here, every knee shall bow to Jesus in universal worship in universal adoration and exaltation, in universal subjection to Him, in universal recognition of Him as being absolute deity and the one and only divine Lord God and judge of heaven and earth. So do you bow the knee, beloved. Do it now before it's too late and you're forced to do it later. I commend you. Bow the knee. I exhort you to do it. So the first thing they're going to do is they're going to bow to him. Secondly, beloved, they're going to confess him. Notice what he says in verse 11. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Again, what I want you to note here is the universal dimension of this truth. All moral beings, men everywhere, in heaven, in hell, on earth, beloved, will constantly and continually do this throughout all eternity. In other words, beloved, the word confess here, exomo legao, means to both personally and publicly acknowledge and profess and confess with the heart and mouth that Jesus Christ is kurios, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that is the omnipotent and almighty one to the glory of God the Father. Do you do that? Lord, you are the omnipotent one, not the government, not my job, not my boss, not my family. You are the sovereign master of my life. I bow to you in my life. Everyone else takes a back seat. I hope you can say that. You see, beloved, when you confess Jesus as Lord, you're saying he's the sovereign and supreme and singular master of the universe. You're saying he's the sovereign and supreme and singular possessor an authority of heaven and earth. He's the ruler and Lord over everyone and everything, everywhere, in every realm, in every sphere, in every dimension, both in heaven and earth and under the earth. That's what you're saying. When you're calling Jesus Lord, or that's what you should be saying, amen? And that's what men will say someday if they do not bow the knee in this life. I see it now. You are the Lord. You are the Master. You are sovereign. You are the one who rules over heaven and earth. You see, beloved, they'll confess him as Lord. Meaning that someday even all atheists and agnostics, meaning that someday all unbelievers and all hardened criminals, someday all 
unreligious people and demons and fallen angels and even Satan himself, beloved, will be then forced to now bow down before him and compelled to now confess Christ as uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Would you say amen out there? I'm saying the Muslim will bow. You listen to me and listen good. Allah is not God. He's not a name for God. A lot of people think he is. Allah was the moon god of the Arabians from the 1st to the 6th or going into the 7th centuries before Muhammad, quote unquote, the prophet, uh, finally said he saw the light. He was the moon god. The, the, the Arabians never liked the sun. They didn't like the desert. It was too hot. But at night, they would what? They would cool off and they'd come out and they'd worship. And so they called the moon Allah. The word for God in Arabic is Isla, not Allah. But you can see how this paganism crept right in. But someday the Muslim will bow the knee, not to Allah, but to Yehovah. Someday the Hare Krishna will bow the knee. Someday, ladies and gentlemen, the Buddhist is going to bow the knee. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, and he's going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And listen to me, you cannot be saved unless you do that. You can't be saved by your works or your religiosity. You can't do it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 9, uh, excuse me, 10, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with a heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth in him should not be afraid. For whosoever believes in him shall do what? He'll call upon the name of Kurios, the Lord. Would you say amen? He'll bow the knee. That's what he'll do. He'll bow the knee to him. But you know, beloved, I was thinking, in Psalm 14, 1, Another confession there. The psalmist said, The fool has said in his heart, No, <laughs> it's amazing to me. The word fool is the word nabal there. And it means the stupid, wicked, and impious one who denies God's three channels of divine revelation to man to prove to him that he exists. Namely, this number one is the general revelation of creation, the physical universe testifies of God. Number two, beloved, is the moral revelation of conscience. It either accuses or else excuses your actions. And you listen to me. The man in China, the man down in Africa, the person over in India, the person in Scotland, the person in America, all have that conscience. Amen? They all have a moral revelation of what is right and wrong. And there has to be someone, that's the teleological argument or ontological argument, that someone put that in there so they'd know it. And then thirdly, beloved, they deny the special revelation of his canon, that is the scriptures. In other words, beloved, they say, I don't care about it. You see, only a fool denies all this. And so accordingly, God calls atheism and uh, uh, agnosticism a true religion, but it's a true religion of fools. You know, I've thought about this over the years, and I concluded that I do not have enough faith to be either an atheist or an agnostic. I don't have it. Beloved, why? Now, these are my words. You may want to incorporate them into your repertoire. Because you have to tacitly deny overwhelming and irrefutable uh, empirical evidence that factually disproves it. And to me, that's the height of stupidity and dishonesty, not to mention self-delusion and self-deception. Amen? I remember reading one time a joke about an atheist. He wanted a holiday, so he went to court and he demanded the judge set aside a day to celebrate atheism. He said, Your Honor, the Christians have uh, Christmas, the Muslims have Ramadan, and the Africans have Kwanzaa. So a atheists need to have a day too. The judge says, You already have one. He says, We do? He says, Yeah, April Fool's Day. See, you've already got a day, and that's what a, only a fool will say in his heart, there is no God. Amen? No, hear me. Listen to me. To bow down in Scripture means more than just your outward position of the body, or like the bending of the knee, or bending at the waist, beloved, or genuflecting, or doing curtsy before someone. It means infinitely more than that. 
It means that there must also be an inward bowing of the heart, an inward bowing of the mind, of the will, an inward bowing of the soul, as well as the outward bowing of the life to Jesus as your Lord God who rules and reigns over you. It isn't enough just to go like this. You need to do this inside. Amen? A lot of people, religious people all over the world, bow down for all kinds of things. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying that when you do this, you're recognizing saying, Lord, you're the master of my life. You're the controller of my life. You're saying, Kurios, Kurios, you are the king and ruler of my life and not me. Lord, wherever you lead, I'll follow. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. You're the boss in my life. You're the Lord over my life, not me. I don't make these decisions. I salute smartly and say, Amen. And I do what it is you want me to do. Now, beloved, make sure you get this. I don't want you to miss this. It's not enough with God for you to just bow on the outside while you're standing up in protest on the inside and kicking up the heel like a stubborn and a disobedient child, and many Christians do that. It's not enough for you, uh, uh, enough with God, for you to just outwardly confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, while inwardly you're still rebelling against Him in your uh, heart. What you're doing is kicking up the heel. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not enough with God for you to just uh, outwardly proclaim Jesus as your Savior, but not submit to His authority and Lordship over you uh, in your life, beloved. You're kicking up the hill. Listen to me now. This is not what the Bible commands or means when it says we're to bow to knee and confess Him as our Lord and our Savior. And yet, many Christians do that very thing. I got Jesus as my Savior, but I don't want Him as my Lord. You see, I've got my life to live. I want to do my thing, my desires, my plans, my purposes. And so you bow to yourself. You don't bow to the Lord. You see, beloved, when you confess Jesus as Lord, when you bow before Him, it means that you now recognize and plan and intend to both inwardly and outwardly make Jesus the sovereign Lord and Master over your life, not you. Make Him the sovereign authority and ruler over your life, not you. You're saying, Lord, you're the boss. You're the head of my life, not me. You see, beloved, you're saying, Lord Jesus, you're the leader. You're my king. And I want you to now sit upon the throne of my heart and in my life and assume the command and control of it because you can do an infinitely better job than I ever can. No wonder I'm so discontent and dissatisfied with life. I'm always trying to pursue my own things. I go down this rabbit trail, and I go down that one, and I got 15 things out. Oh, beloved, you can't do that. You just can't do it. You're trying to be an a, a, a expert in everything but a master of none, and you can't do it. So you need to prioritize your life, amen? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying those who submit to the Lord... Those who call Jesus Lord, those who bow before him are saying, Lord, I want to bring my life in harmony and conformity to your word, will, and ways of my life. I want to submit to the authority of what they say about you and what they say about me and what I should do in my life to you. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, I'm asking you this morning, do you bow the knee or do you kick up the hill? A lot of people kick up the heel and they defy the Lord. Yeah, yeah, right, I know what he says right there, but you know, I've got my own thing or whatever, yeah, and I've heard it a thousand times. So you're infringing right now, presuming upon the mercy of God. Presumptuous sin, amen? David prayed in Psalm 19, keep back these presumptuous and these secret sins too, but these presumptuous sins, how I'm presuming on his mercy. And because he hasn't judged me yet, who says he hasn't? Have you examined your life? Who says he hasn't? <laughs> See, you're waiting for him to send you a telegram, an email, text. I judge you today. That doesn't happen. All you have to do is review your life. Examine yourself, Paul said, to see whether or not you be in the faith. Amen? Now, beloved, we've all seen pictures of Tim Tebow taking a knee after a touchdown in prayer and praise to God. And we've also seen the NFL players doing it out of protest during the national anthem. And it's amazing. You say, we're protesting social injustice. But listen, beloved. 
You come to a football game to be entertained, not get uh, into political, the political arena. How about if I were to take a knee and say, I'm against drunkenness? Another guy comes and says, well, I'm against drugs. Another one says, I'm against smog in the environment. So next thing you know, you've got the whole spectators all bowing down during the national anthem. It's stupid. You want to get involved in social injustice, then what you need to do is get involved in it and leave football and baseball and sports out of the arena. People are not coming to see your political views. They're coming to see you play football and entertain them or baseball or whatever it may be. So stupid. I get so fired up when I think about it. And, and, and by the way, I'll tell you right now, the only game I saw last year was the last half of the Patriots because Bob Kraft said that people in the Patriots are going to stand up. I don't watch any. I, I wouldn't give them the time or day. I wouldn't give them a nickel for what they're doing right now. Beloved, I had too many friends that came back in caskets with a flag draped over them. And I'm lucky that I didn't. There's no possible way. So, beloved, there's four things I want to show you quickly, and I mean quickly. Number one is to bow the knee is a sign of recognition of God. Number two, to bow the knee is a sign of reverence for God. Number three, to bow the knee is a sign of respect to God. And number four, to bow the knee is a sign of repentance before God. Now, let's look at point number one. To bow the knee is a sign of recognition to God. We read it this morning. In Psalm chapter 95, verse 6, it exhorts us, O come, let us worship, now listen, and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Now I want you to see here, ladies and gentlemen, that the psalmist invites all men to exercise postures and praises of piety to God and recognition of who is God. God really is. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, what he's saying is this God is the great I am. Look up. He's the great I am. Everybody look up. He's the great I am. He's the great creator and maker of all things, visible and invisible, including us. And yet even though we are but mere fallen creatures, we've been given the invite and the privilege to come to God's presence through Christ and worship Him and adore Him and to pay homage and tribute to Him. Tribute is our divine maker. Tribute is our designer. Tribute is our architect and deity, the singular deity and God of the universe. God is saying to us, can you imagine, beloved, we're like a speck down here and heaven of heavens can't feel Him, yet He says, come unto me, bow your knee. Jesus said, come unto me, ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest to your souls. Amen. And Matthew chapter 11. But you see, beloved, what's he saying to us? He's saying you need to come and you need to bow down. So the context here in this text uh, is folks now going to the temple. They're going into the house of God or the church to do this. How often... Do you do all this in your life out of tacit recognition of who this awesome and almighty God truly is? I ask you, beloved, how often do you come to church? How often, ladies and gentlemen, do you come to Sabbath school or morning service or prayer meeting to adore Him, to bow down to Him, to kneel before Him as the Lord your Maker? How often do you do that? Uh, People say, well, I've got to come every Sabbath morning. So you're an SMO, Sabbath morning only. God says we should all do it as often as we possibly can. And even the more as we see that day approaching, it says in Hebrews 10, 25. Amen? You see, beloved, how faithful are you to come to church and corporate and public worship to be in the divine presence of the Lord and bow the knee before Him like this is your Creator and your God. I ask you, is it just sporadically or occasionally? When I get the feeling, when it's convenient for me, Is it just, beloved, infrequently and irregularly? Or is it just sometimes, God forbid, or rarely? Is coming to church, bowing the knee before God, standing in His presence in corporate worship, a real priority in your life? You say, well, I don't feel it. Beloved, you need to look at it from God's perspective, not your own. 
See, even when we come on a Wednesday night and we're tired and we've been working and we've had everything pulled at us, beloved, I always understand, Lord, I'm coming into your presence. It's not what the preacher's really going to do for me. It's what you're going to do through the preacher as I stand in your presence. Would you say amen? And that's the way you have to look at it. You know what? I'm just tired. You know, oh, I had a rough day. Uh, I, I, I'm just a, but that's the cause of apostasy and lukewarmness uh, that's going through the church right now. So, beloved, I ask you, do you bow the knee? Do you bow the knee? You know, in Romans chapter 14, verse 11, Paul said this, For it is written, and he's quoting all the way from the Old Testament, that someday every knee shall bow to me, that's Christ, and every tongue shall confess, that is me, to God. Someday you will bow. Someday I will bow. Someday, every human being in every continent on the top side of this earth will bow their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, we're either going to do it willingly now in this life, in God's house, in our life, or we're going to be forced to do it later uh, before the great white throne judgment uh, in glory on the day of judgment. What I'm saying to you, beloved, is this, is that people are going to bow. A lot of people, because of their pride and their haughtiness and their arrogance, don't want to bow to anyone, and yet God says, submit yourself unto them to have the rule over you. In other words, are you to bow to me? Yes. Not bow like this, but bow to my authority, because I'm not, though I'm fallible and I'm a person, I'm your pastor. It's a sacerdotal office given by God, so you can learn the Word of God, so you can be ministered to through somebody. If you're waiting for someone to be perfect, beloved, you're not even going to have uh, anybody on this earth minister to you. And by the way, look in the mirror. You'll see how perfect you are. Most of you wouldn't say to yourself what you say about other people if you look in the mirror. Amen? You say, Pastor, you're scratching me right where it itches. I'm trying to. Now, beloved, in Psalm 22, 9, listen to what he says. Uh, 29. All they that go down to the dust shall worship, and I took this from the Hebrew, by the way, and bow before him, even he who cannot keep his own soul alive. That's what the Hebrew literally says. In other words, those who won't bow down someday will bow down. Amen? They can't even keep their own soul alive. And if they can't do that, that means they're not God, because only God can keep souls alive. He's the Father of all spirits. Amen? And so we need to get a divine perspective on things, a biblical perspective on things, instead of our own fallen, human, finite perspective uh, on all things in the Scriptures. Amen? Oh, beloved, listen to me. To daily bow the knee to Christ as Lord in your life signifies that you recognize His deity, not just His humanity, but you recognize His deity in your life. You recognize He's God. You recognize His authority and Lordship over you. And that you also recognize your own fallenness. Your own uh, uh, um, mortality and sinfulness and indebtedness to Him. And your own subjection or, uh, to Him as your sovereign Lord and God of heaven and earth. Beloved, when I read the word Lord, that's what pops into my mind all the time. He's the King, I'm the subject. I'm to be in subjection to Him. Not just looking at it as a title, but looking at it, what that title genuinely means to us. Amen? Is He Lord of your life? Are you in subjection to Him? Do you bow the knee before Him? I hope you can say, Amen, preacher. Come on. That's for the other guy over there. Let you get him. You scratch him right where it itches. You see, beloved, God says, I want you to submit to me. I want you to surrender your life to me. And when you do that, you bow the knee. Amen? You see, the Bible says that Jesus bowed the knee to the Father, being positionally, not personally, positionally greater than Him on earth. The Bible says that Peter and Paul and all of the apostles bowed the knee to Jesus daily in their worship of Him, beloved. They saw Him as Lord. They saw Him as God. The Bible says that many sinners, many lepers, many sick and demon-possessed people all ran up to Jesus and they bowed the knee before Him in worship. And then they were forgiven. And then they were saved. And then they were reconciled with God. And then they were healed and delivered from all of their sins and infirmities, beloved. And then, when they did that, the supernatural power of God's Spirit and grace and Word was unlocked, unloaded, and unleashed in their life 
got the blessings that they desired in their life. Amen? Oh, if we could only understand that, grasp that, come to grips with that. It's not just believing it, it's doing it. And that's the key that unlocks that power of God in your life. Why did they get what they wanted? Because they bowed the knee. They humbled themselves before God. And they bowed the knee. Oh, listen to me, beloved. We must never bow the knee in worship to men or angels or anything or anyone else. Amen? I'm saying you must never bow the knee to your family, your friends, or rock stars, or movie stars, or athletes, which a lot of people do. Oh, they get all giddy. They're bowing the knee. Oh, he's my hero. He's my role model. She's my role model. I want to look like them. I want to follow them. Oh, beloved, you get your eyes fixed in the wrong place. You hear me now, ladies and gentlemen. You're looking in the wrong area. See, you don't look only to the Lord God, beloved. So do you bow the knee to him, or are you stiff-necked? God says again and again, beloved, these people are stiff-necked. They've hardened their heart. They will not do it. I can work miracle after miracle, but they won't do it. I can preach sermon after sermon, but they won't do it. I can send prophet after prophet, but they won't do it. They're stiff-necked. They're hard-hearted. They think they're going to do it in their own time, and I've told you, you cannot do that apart from the Lord, apart from Him giving you grace, apart from Him coming upon you first, taking the divine initiative in your life, you cannot bow the knee to Him. He gives you the oomph to do it. And if you don't grab it and cease it while it's there, I'll tell you, someday you'll never be able to do it. He's going to pass you by. He's going to say, you know what, They've, I've given them grace after grace, glory after glory, a measure of faith after faith, and they still won't do it. They won't do it. So leave them alone. And if you split hell wide open, it's your fault, not God's. Don't you blame God. Don't you go blaming God for that. Amen. So, beloved, that's the recognition of God. Number two, I want you to see that bowing the knee is a sign of reverence for God. I want to make this clear to you before I get a little technical. The Scripture teaches that reverence really means to have a healthy fear of the Lord. When we talk about reverence, that's what it really means. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, are you a person who fears the Lord? Are you a God-fearer? I hope you say amen, Pastor. I really am. I fear Him for who He is, His promises, as well as His threats if I don't obey Him. See, we like to look at the promises, we like to look at the blessings, but we don't want to see the what? The threats. And beloved, you listen to me. If you have a burden for your kids, you better teach them this. Do you hear what I said to you? If you have a burden for the souls of your children, if you love their love more than you love their soul, something is wrong with you. You don't really believe in hell. You don't want to believe what Jesus died for. And you're going to let them just drift along, go along, go with the world, get a good education, whatever it may be. Then what? split hell wide open and they'll go to a deeper hell because they've heard all the truth that you had to say I'd shake the fire out of my kids before I let that happen and I did <laughs> there's no way beloved I believe that hell is real I've been in the presence of the Lord that I'm aware of three times in my life and I'll tell you beloved I was paralyzed I could not move and, and I don't say this boastfully but I can usually move pretty good even with a bad back but I tell you, I was paralyzed. I was overwhelmed with his presence. I said, stay thy hand. And can you imagine? Your son, your daughter, is one heartbeat away from meeting that God. One breath. God forbid they should get in a car accident. God forbid someone should cap them, shoot them. God forbid they should get stabbed. Then you're going to sit at the funeral and you're going to want somebody to eulogize what a wonderful child they were, what a gifted person they were, and they split hell wide open. They say, Mom, Dad, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? I needed to bow the knee. I needed to bow the knee. And I didn't bow the knee, but you didn't press it with me. You just went along to go along. So I love you. Well, I love my kids, but if they didn't bow the knee, but I'll tell you what, I would not support them in their unbelief. They probably don't want to visit me after I tell them, listen, they walk in the door, hi, it's good to see you. Listen, have you accepted Jesus yet? Have you bowed the knee to Jesus yet? No, you're going to hell. I want you to know that. Daddy wants you to know that. 
I don't want you to go there, but Daddy wants you to know that. And it's serious business, isn't it? We, we, listen to me. We look at the TV and movie and everything going on around us, and we say, everything's so nice and everything. Uh, beloved, you know what? You're just trying to get above the reality. Christians need to understand the reality of what's going on. And they need to have a genuine burden for their families, for their children, for their spouses. They have to. Have, when I got saved, beloved, I'll tell you right now, my wife and I, for three and a half years, went nose to nose over Jesus Christ. It almost put us in divorce court. That's the truth. And my wife said to me, Joel, if it was another woman, I'd understand it. But Jesus? I said, that's right, Jesus. Another woman isn't going to save you. Another man isn't going to save you. But Jesus will. You need to be saved, Billy. As good as a person you are, you're lost. I was a rascal, and I saw my, my sins real quick. But she was brought up in the Waltons. I was, we came from polar opposites, sides of the street. And that means nothing before God, by the way. Jesus said that the sinners, the drunks, the harlots, the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before the religious leaders, before the rulers of Israel. Because they'll humble themselves and the elders won't. Amen. They bow the knee is what I'm saying to you. You see, beloved, the word reverence, it means to stand in awe and amazement of someone. It means to highly esteem and admire a person. It means to greatly exalt and venerate and honor one in your life. And in regards to God, it means to bow the knee before Him in worship and adoration. I want you to hear what Jesus had to say in John chapter 5, verse 23. Jesus said this, now listen. He says, all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. And he that honoreth not the Son also honors not the Father who sent him. You say, Pastor, you're kind of getting me upset. But I'm not trying to. You're being convicted. That's what conviction is. You see, beloved, my job is to not make you comfortable. I don't want to make you comfortable. I don't ever want you to be comfortable with me. I don't ever want to tickle your ears. That's not me. It will never be me. You have to throw me out before I do. And I guarantee you, beloved, if I'm preaching the word and you throw me out, this church will go right downhill. Because if you get somebody else behind the pulpit right here, beloved, not preaching the truth, God will not bless this church. Because God blesses His Word. Amen? And God blesses the man that's preaching the Word. And I'm not saying that because of me. I'm saying that because that's what the Bible teaches. So, beloved, the question is, do you daily honor the Father through the Son with your words and your works? Do you daily honor the Father through the Son with your testimony and with your witness and with your lives in your lifestyle, beloved? In other words, this is what I'm saying to you. Are you constantly and continuously mindful and aware and focused on God's presence in your life every day? In other words, do you sense His nearness and His dearness to you so much that it reverently influences the way you think, the way you feel, the way you act, the way you react? The way you interact, you're sensing God. You walk Him circumspectly, reverently before the Lord. You feel His presence. You know His presence is there. Not just, you know what, I came to church, met with God, I got my own thing now, I got to go do my... And you forget all about that. That's not what making Jesus Lord of your life is about, ladies and gentlemen. That's not bowing the knee to Jesus, amen? It's constantly and continuously being aware of Him in your life, mindful of Him. Sensing his presence, draw nigh unto God, and he'll what? Draw nigh unto you. Is that a promise? Yes, it is. And God wants to be able to do that, beloved. So I'm saying this, beloved. Do you fear the Lord? Do you fear the Lord? Do you walk reverently and circumspectly before the Lord and honor him? Lord, I want to honor you today with my life and with my lips and everything that I do. Or are you always focused on earthly and worldly things? Now examine yourself. Take a second. Do you hear what I just said to you? Are you thinking about him all day, beloved, or are you focused on earthly and worldly things? You know what Paul said to the church of Colossus in Colossians 3, 1 through 4? He said, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on these things of this earth. For you are dead, 
and your life was hid with Christ in God, for when Christ was our life shall appear, then shall you appear with him all. Amen? Set your affections not on your job, not on your family, not on everything else. There's nothing wrong with having affections for your family, but you know what I'm saying, the priority here. Set your affections on, uh, uh, on God, on heavenly things. Why? Everything on this earth is going to be consumed and burned up. Your house, your car, your money, your finances, everything except your soul, everything except your relationship with God. Bow the knee. Do you bow the knee? Thirdly, beloved, to bow the knee is a sign of respect to God. You know, no one likes to be dissed. That's what they say today, or disrespected, amen? To respect God is to show great concern and courtesy and consideration for His highly exalted and esteemed person and position and presence and power in every area and aspect and affair of your life. Making sure that you honor and uphold His reputation in your life, not just your own. A good name is better to be had than certain riches, especially God's name. Amen? Making sure that you uh, um, always give Him the benefit of the doubt in those questionable things in gray areas before you do it. Listen to me. The Bible does not teach you cannot drink alcohol. I used to I, when I used to teach, the uh, first 18 years of my walk with the Lord, I taught enforced willful abstention. Because I can see the danger. A lot of people have no control whatsoever. But the Bible does teach, if you're going to do that, you need to do it privately. Because if anyone else is around you that's had a problem with alcohol, and they see you do it, and it, uh, it makes them perish because they'll go back into drinking, and they go to hell, God will hold you accountable for it. Beloved, that's a fact. That's a fact. If you're going to do it, you do it at home and by yourself. Amen. Before the Lord. Hast thou faith? Do it before God, the Bible says. If you have faith. But if you've had a problem with alcohol, you should never do it. You're sinning now. So before you ever do anything in a questionable area or gray area, Lord, do you want me to do this? And if you don't get an answer yet, what should you do? You bow the knee. You don't do it. You don't walk around like the world. Everything seems so good. We're at the parties and we're drinking. We're doing this. We're just having fun. But we love you too, Jesus. And then someone over there in the corner who just accepted Jesus, who's trying to stay dry, sees you do it, and you've talked to them about the Lord. And they say, well, I guess if he can do it, well, I can go back and do it. And they go to hell. God says, you're the problem. You see, beloved, you've not bowed the knee in that area, have you? You see, but let's have a respect for God. Making sure that you don't say or do anything that will ever cast disgrace or discredit or dishonor on him and his reputation. Beloved, to live for self and not do this is to disrespect God and not bow the knee. Listen to me. Listen to me. Do you bow the knee, wives, in your marriage? Do you bow the knee like the Bible says? The Bible says, ladies or women, you're supposed to submit yourselves unto your husband as unto the Lord. If you don't do that, you're disrespecting God. You're not the boss of the home. He's the head. God made it that way. It doesn't mean he's better than you. But God made it that way. Beloved, listen to me. Do you bow the knee, husbands, to love your wives? See, that's Ephesians 5. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church. If you're loving your wife, she'll want to bow. She'll want to submit to you. Amen. And kids, listen to me. Do you bow the knee to your parents? He goes on in Ephesians chapter 5, and he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And if you don't do it, you're disrespecting God. You're saying, I don't care what you have to say. So, beloved, that's number three. I told you, number one, to bow the knee is a sign of recognition of God. It's a sign of reverence for God. It's a sign of respect to God. And lastly, and I'll close with this, it's a sign of repentance before God. Repentance before God. Christians ought to live in a state of repentance, a state of saving and sanctifying grace every day. Repentance is not a one-time act in our life, is it? Now, ladies and gentlemen, to repent denotes that you've seen your sins and the error of your ways, and you have now volitionally turned to God and confessed your sins through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've been forgiven. Why? Because you were so convicted, you bowed the knee. 
Ladies and gentlemen, you bow to knee to Christ as your Lord and Savior in deep sorrow and conviction and contrition, and you realize you have transgressed God's law. The word transgression in the New Testament means to cross the line. Uh, if, I, if I put up a private property sign and somebody step, steps over the line, what have they done? They've crossed the line. A lot of people don't understand. They cross the line. They go one side of it, and then they come back, and they go the other side, and they keep crossing back and forth like that because they've not bowed the knee to Christ yet. I, I know I shouldn't be doing this, and I, I know the world's doing it, but I want to have fun. I want, but you know what? I love you too, Jesus. And Beloved, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You say, Pastor, I'm going to get... You know, I never, I, I never thought when I put this message together I was going this route with the Spirit of God. I guess just kind of put it, I thought it was going to be a positive message. That's what I told my wife. I'm positive that it's negative, okay? <laughs> you see, beloved, I've taught you before, repentance is a change of mind. Lord, I can't do that anymore. I, I know I need to turn from that and turn to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it leads to a change of heart. Oh, my goodness, me, a copa, I'm so sorry for what I did. And ultimately, when you get saved, Christ comes into your life with his power and his spirit, and he changes your life because you bowed the knee. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. See, a lot of kids are watching us, and they say, how can they do that? And they're thinking with a carnal mind, a fleshy mind. They don't understand what's happened inside of us yet. That supernatural act of God. It's a miracle, kids. But yeah, if you want it, you've got to bow the knee. You'll see. You're saying, I can't live like that. No, you can't the way you're in the flesh. You can't do it. But you can when the Spirit of God. You'll want to do it when he comes in. Right? You'll want to do it. I, beloved, I would no more want to go back to my old life than I would want to jump off a bridge. And I did that one time. I'll give you a quick little story. Once when I was in Vietnam, we were in this little village, and there was a, there was a um, railroad trestle, and it was 45 feet over the water. And so we were doing a patrol that day, and so we walked in, and they all said, eh, but you don't dare to jump off that trestle. And you didn't ever dare me. <laughs> I says, really? They says, yeah. I says, okay. Well, in my backpack, I had a pair of shorts. Well, they were cut off pants. So I took my stuff off, I set a little perimeter, and I climbed up that trestle. And beloved, being up that trestle, you know, 45 feet may not look a lot from the ground, but when you're standing up there looking down, and by the way, they teach you in the core, 30 feet jumping into the water is like hitting cement. And I didn't jump feet first. I said, Geronimo! Ploosh! <laughs> well, I hate to say it, I went down, 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 and I lost my suit. I was as naked as a jaybird. So I came up, and they had a, it was a $250 kitty. I won the kitty. And I said, hey, fellas, get my pants. They said, why? I said, I lost my son. <laughs> and they said, ah, the sergeant lost his suit. <laughs> well, come and get it. <laughs> I said, come on, fellas. I'll have you on a, a, an ambush tomorrow night. You know? <laughs> oh, but I don't know where I was going with that anyways. You see, beloved, as a new creation in Christ, what I'm saying is now you've forsaken your sins and you're living in this state of grace that God wants you to. And you bow the knee to Christ as your Lord and Savior and your God, and He controls your life. So, beloved, do you bow the knee to Jesus in your daily walk and talk? That's what I want to ask you. Has it ever dawned on you to do that? Do you bow the knee to Jesus in your daily pursuits and priorities and your work and your job? How about your testimonies? How about your trials? Well, I tried to do it God's way, but now it's just the pressure's getting so much, and I just got to do it the world's way. How about in your habits and your entertainment? Do you watch all the wicked things on TV and go to the movies and watch all these wicked things? Is you bow the knee in that area when God says, I'll set no wicked thing before my eyes? Right? Well, everybody else is doing it. There's other Christians. What do you care? What you're, you're not going to be judged for what they do. They're going to be judged for what you do. How about, ladies and gentlemen, do you bow the knee to Jesus in your daily consecration and service? In other words, is He truly Lord of your life, and, or are you still on the throne? Beloved, we're either going to do it willingly now, 
but we're going to be forced to do it later. Amen? Listen to me. Christ is more than just a prophet or a teacher. That's how a lot of people see him today. Christ is more than just an advocate with the Father, more than just a mediator, more than just our high priest. He's the Lord God Almighty himself. An alien from heaven who infinitely resided in eternity as God, beloved, and tiptoed across the Milky Way to this earth to become a man and redeem us. Why? Because he loved us. And then he resurrected and ascended back to heaven. He's enthroned at the right hand of the Father. Would you say amen out there? The Bible says every knee shall bow. Every knee. Either willingly or be compelled to. So do you bow the knee to Jesus on the outside while you're standing up on the inside? I hope you don't do that. Beloved, that's literally kicking up the heel. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, I won't give you the whole context there, just quickly. Paul's speaking about to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and someday we have a glorified immortal body waiting for us. Amen? Even in an intermediate uh, state, we have a body. Paul says, but knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Imagine Paul was caught up to the third heaven. Paul had a great relationship with God, but he said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's why I let them beat me. That's why I let them hit me with rods. That's why I let them stone me. That's why I let myself be shipwrecked a night and a day in the deep. Why? Because we know the terror of the Lord. Heaven is real. And beloved, this is a fact. I, 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 I counted this myself. Jesus mentioned hell seven times more than he mentioned heaven in heaven. You count them. If, if I remember right, it's 60 verses, whatever it was. Uh, but can you imagine? I, I don't say that to scare you, beloved. I say that to you because of the reality of what it means to bow the knee to Jesus. Amen? So the question is, do you bow the knee? I hope you can say amen. I do, Pastor. Kids, have you bowed the knee yet? You need to. Don't let this pass you by. Eternity is at stake. Not a week, not 10 years, not 20 years. Listen, you can grow old 60, 70 years, and then for the rest of eternity be separated from God in a place called the lake of fire. Separated from family, friends, people in the church, and you don't want that. God says, I want you to bow the knee. I am your Lord. Let's go to the throne of grace.